So the topic of functional dependencies are uh, basically it's a property about our tables that are inherent by nature in our tables. So, um, for example, suppose this was a, a table in, in our database, and suppose we had a, well this is kind of like at a college, let's say, we have a, so a student's registering for courses, so the registration number 123-1 is saying that a student with the student ID 123, and in the, now in this case I'm just using student name, I'm just using a first name, um, the back one. The first name for the student, and then that uh, is all you need. So everyone has a unique first name and last name. Uh, just sorry, just the first name, and then the course they're registered for, who the teacher of the course is, and what the name of the textbook is. So suppose by name, you know, by inherently the registration number, this column can uniquely tell us the student ID the student's name, the course, the teacher, and the textbook. If you, if you knew the registration number, you'd get the other five fields. You know exactly which ones they are. You can't have any, any ambiguity to it. Suppose also the student ID will always tell you the student's name. So suppose if I just gave you this field, you could tell me exactly who the student is. It's not multiple students could be mapped to that same number. And then suppose also the course can tell you who the teacher is and the textbook. If you know the course, the name of the course, so this would be like a university that only has one database course. So from the one and only course, you know the teacher and the textbook. So we draw these arrows saying that the registration number implies these fields. From those fields, you could get it. From the student ID, you could get the student's name. From the course, you could get the teacher's name and the textbook. So sometimes we could symbolically write this like this. From field A, we can get B, C, D, E, and F. In addition to that, from field B, we can get field C. And also, if you told me field D, I could tell you what E and F are, exactly what those ones are. So this is, you know, these, these fields are functionally dependent on that field. OK. So <clears throat> if. Uh, there are certain rules that you know are worth going over on the concept of um, if you have one variable and infers you know something else. So, for example, a lot of these are intuitive. So, one is the uh, inference rule number one is the reflexive rule, which basically says um, if y is a subset of x, so x could be a group of fields and y is one of those fields. If you know x, of course you know what y is, because you would know all the components of x, so you'd know what x is. Um, the augmentation rule that says uh, x, if x implies y, knowing what x is, you could tell exactly what y is. Then if you knew x and some other field like z, you would know y and z, because you, you know what z is, so from z you would know z, and from x you would know y. Again, hopefully that's kind of intuitive. Um, the transitive rule says if you know x, knowing x gives you y, and if also knowing y would give you z, well then if you knew x, you could figure out what z is. You'd have to do it in two steps. You'd have to figure out what y is and then take y and figure out what z is. Then other uh, useful inference rules is the decomposition one. If you knew x, if knowing x could tell you what y and z are, well then knowing x could tell you what y is just dropping off the z part. Uh, the union rule says if you know x, if, if x can tell you what y is and x can tell you what z is, well then x can tell you what y and z is. Again, these are all intuitive rules. And then the pseudo-transitive rule is if x can tell you y and w and y can tell you z, then x can get you y and x with w could get you z. So x and w combined could get you to z. So if you're given situations like an example like this. Suppose uh, you were told x, the field or fields x, the set x, can tell you what y is, and x can tell you what z is. Can you, from x, figure out what y and z is? So the proof is, so theoretically, 
all the proofs can be, if, if the statement is true, you could take combinations of these six rules and then just keep rewriting, rewriting those rules. So in this case, we could take, we, take, we start off with the two rules that we were given, x implies y, x implies z. And then we use rule number two, uh, using rule number two, um, augmenting with x, we can get, we can note that x and x will imply x. So we can say that x, x and x actually gives us x and y. Then we could take, uh, we can show that x, y gives us y and z by using rule two on line number two and augmenting the y with it. And now if x can give you x and y, and x, y can give you y and z, then x can give you y and z by rule number three, combining line three and line four using this rule number three again. The transit one, x gives you y and y gives you z, then x gives you z. So you can almost write software. You know, if you can program, it's not, wouldn't be a big artificial intelligence thing to do, to program in these six rules and just keep running them over and over to see if you get the uh, thing you're trying to prove to come out. So another example would be um, if W gives you Y and X gives you Z, then if you had W and X together, can you figure out what Y is? Now, you could probably see intuitively you could because all you, you don't even need W. No, I'm sorry, you don't even need, you don't even need X. If you have W, you can figure out what Y is. So giving you W plus in addition to that X, you could just ignore the X and you'll figure it out. But if you wanted to programmatically use those six rules, we would take the rule we're given, W gives you Y, that's given, X gives you Z, that's given, then W and X combined would give you X and Y using the first rule number two on line one. <clears throat> so we're just putting X's on each side. Then another rule we could do is we could use inference rule number one, say x, y will give you y. And now, since w, x gives you x, y, and x, y gives you y, w, x will give you y. Like I say, this one is probably so intuitive, you would just look at that with your eyes and say, yeah, I can figure that out. That, that rule is true. Okay, so here's another example. If x gives you y, and x gives you z and w, then with w and y, could you figure out what z is? If you had w and y. Oh, I'm sorry. If you had w and y, you could figure out what z is. So now, could x give you z? So you would take rule, rule that they gave you number one, rule that they gave you number two, rule that they gave you number three, and then you'd say x implies x, y, using the x, x gives x, y from rule two on taking rule, <laughs> this rule here, number one here, and applying it to the inference rule number two. We can show that this is true. Then x and y gives y and w using inference rule number two on this line. So we're putting a y on each side of the arrow. And then uh, wy, uh, x gives wy on rule number three, putting lines four and five together. So if x gives xy and xy gives wy, then x will give you wy. And then inference rule three on line six and three. So if x gives you w and y, and w and y gives you z, then x will give you z. Okay, so all the ones that are true, all the ones that are true, you would keep reapplying those rules until you spit out the exact rule you would get. If it turns out to not be true, <coughs> for example, if x, knowing x and y would give z and knowing y would give w, is it therefore true that x and w provide, will tell you exactly what z is, if you knew x and w? And if it's not true, so we could, you could keep applying those rules over and over and over and hope you eventually show that this is true. But you may spend a lot of time and not get anywhere with it. So what you try to do is come up with an example of a table 
that follows this. This rule and this rule are followed, but this one is not followed, then that would be a counterexample to it. So in this case, um, the rule that says, given x and y, you can uniquely figure out exactly what z is. There's no ambiguity. So if we had an x and a y, x, x is 1, y is 1, we get a specific value for z. And when x is 1 and y is 2, we get a different value for z. So in other words, if, this, if there was a 2 here and a 2 here, then we couldn't say, if you tell me what x and y is, I can tell you exactly what z is, because they would come out the same. So. And then if we, have, if we say y implies w, the value of 1 gives us a value of 1 and 2 gives us a value of 1. So we would know if you tell me what y is, I can tell you what w is. And also, yeah, like we said before, the x and the y, if we knew what the x and the y is, a 1 and a 1 gives 2, and a 1 and a 2 gives 3. Now the question is, if I know what x and w are, will I know exactly what z is? Well, when, x is, when w is 1, and x is 1, we may get a 2 for z, and when w is 1 and x is 1, we may get a 3 for z. So we don't know. If I told you x, if I told you w and x, and said, can you now tell me what z is, this two-line example, you can't figure out what z is. So this statement is not true. If this is true and this is true, this is still not necessarily true. Okay, so that's just, you know, some examples on, on uh, functional dependency. Okay, now, suppose we had, so why is this interesting to look at? So let's go back to our original table of students registering for classes. And we have, like we said before, you know the registration number, you know the student ID, the student name, the course, the teacher, and the textbook. You'll get all that information. If you know the student's ID, if you know the student's ID, you can figure out the student's name. You don't know what courses they're in, you need more information. And if you knew the course, you know the course, it'll tell you the teacher in the book. So like I say, this at this university apparently, there's one version of database, one version of algorithms. Not multiple teachers teaching the same books. Okay, so now the question is, um, suppose we made the decision, this table's too big, we'd like to cut it into two smaller tables. So I said, okay, we'll take the registration. We'll have the registration number, the student ID and the student's name. Put that in one table. And then have another table called student classes, where you just take the student's name, and then also write the classes that they're registered for. Put them in two separate tables, and make updates as needed. So the question is, is there any problem with doing this? And it's kind of what we were talking about last, last class with the SQL statements. We could do queries like say, give me all of the, uh, let's say you want to say, give me all the classes Mohammed's registered for. So you go through one table looking for all the records with Mohammed, then you have to go through this table looking for a match and join them together and then print out all the results. So if we did that, the way we decided to break this table down would basically say, if, you, if we looked at a natural join of the two tables, so you said just make rows, com combinations of all rows, wherever we have a matching column and the data matches. So for example, we would take this data, Sandeep and Sandeep match here, and we take all this data, and we'd make one big row out of this whole thing. Then we would take the next one, so we'd be going down one table, and then starting at the beginning and looking for matches and creating records from. So now we would take Mary, and we go down this whole table looking for a match, and we have a match, and that would be one of our output rows. Then we'd go, we'd have Mohammed, go to the beginning here, find a match, we found a match, so this data and this data is a registration record. Then we're still on this one, and we go down to the next one, and we have a match. So now we generate another record. So this one matches this, this one matches this, this one matches this, and this one matches this. So our new table has this as registration. But because of the matching name, we ended up generating two new courses that that student's not registered in. So the point is this, is, this, would, be, this would not be a safe way to break the table down. 
because then when you start doing natural joins, you have new registration records. So we might want to pick different fields of how to break the data down. So really, the topic we're talking about is part of database administration is you design a table, and then maybe one table's getting too big or has too much redundant data, you might want to split it into two tables. You don't want to lose the meaning of the database, or, or actually in this case, have registration, class registrations that didn't happen. Um, so you have to be careful about the way that you break the table down. So they call this a though they call this a lossless join. Uh, they call this a lossless join um, decomposition when a, 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 something like this happens. So before you go and consider breaking down a table, you should perform a test to see if the way you break the table down will generate new records. Uh, new unwanted records, re records that weren't in the original table. So this is the algorithm. You can take a little time and read it. I don't know if it will come out on the camera, but it will be in the slides if you want. But uh, maybe I'll just kind of walk through the way the algorithm works. So suppose we had, this is the same as the table we had before. A gives us B, C, D, E, and F. B gives us C, and D gives us E and F. So what we do is we create this little table. You can do it on an Excel spreadsheet if you want. And you write labels in all your boxes. For every relation you have, for every table you have, <coughs> you, uh, you create a row in this table. And you label it, you know, they use the letter B in our textbook, uh, B11, B12, B13. You know, just have a unique symbol in each box. Then for every rule that we have up here, any one of these rules, <coughs> if one field, um, no, I'm sorry. So the, fir the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the tables we've created. So we have A, B, and C is one table, and then um, C, D, E, and F is another table. So we use a bigger symbol, um, A1, 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 to mean that these three are joined together. And then A2, 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 meaning these are joined together. Then taking these symbols in this table, apply any of these rules, and if there's a rule that says that one field will give all of the other fields in it, then you could say that this field will use whatever symbol we have here and put it in each one of these places. And the idea is if you ever put have the same symbol in an entire row, then that table split you're considering has that lossless join decomposition problem, and you don't want to do that. So we took the rule A gives us B, C, D, E, and F, and applied it to this table, and said that whatever symbol is here, put the same symbol in all the fields we can get. And we ended up getting one entire row having the same symbol. So that table split would have the lossless join decomposition problem. Okay. And then, okay, so what we'll do on, a, on probably our next class, we'll talk about putting tables into normal forms. And I guess we'll pick up on, we'll, do, we'll consider the first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, and also the voice card normal form. But it's just a way to um, have your tables broken down so that um, we don't have that problem where new records get created. So we'll pick up, um, yeah, I guess we'll pick up from, on the normal forms. Uh, on our next class. Okay. Any, any questions though about the functional dependencies? Yeah? Next class will be the midterm or Yeah, no, so right, next class will be the midterm. So this will be after our midterm. So I, didn't, I don't want to go into this now and then go, because uh, there's, we're calling about normal forms. It's just a way of designing your database so that data integrity stays the same, but you could break it down into smaller tables. And we'll go through like a whole big build up how we got to this this one being, you know, a common best practice to use. So. Okay.